you are welcome to today's video. Thank you for coming back. Quite a few interesting new developments today, but I'm going to start off with an intriguing story about vitamin D. Now, we mentioned a few days ago when we were looking at an interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci, the leading infectious diseases doctor in the States. He mentioned in the interview that he was personally taking vitamin D and vitamin C. So I was intrigued to know the dose because is it the same as the official guidelines was kind of my main question. And um, this is the story that's unfolded. So this is from uh, Dr. Uh, Carrie uh, Hedgelt, whose name I've probably pronounced wrong, Dr. Sorry. Anyway, um, he actually wrote to Dr. Fauci. Uh, you mentioned in a recent interview that you take vitamin D supplement. For greater audience, it would be most interesting to know the dose that you use. And uh, as far as I can tell, this is completely genuine. Um, it looks like a completely genuine uh, National Institutes of Health uh, email. And Dr. Fauci has written back and said 6,000 international units per day. Fascinating. And then Carrie bounced that uh, back, onto, uh, back onto me. And has given me permission to share his, uh, his name and details. So I appreciate that. The initiative that you've taken there. Um, now, so what this is saying... Is, uh, is Dr. Fauci is taking, as far as we can gather from this, 6,000 international units a day, which is equal to 150 micrograms. So that's the dose he seems to be taking. Now, we have mentioned a few times that when it's not sunny, I am personally taking uh, that, 50 micrograms. So that's what, uh, that's what I'm taking. Now... We have to stress, and I have to keep stressing this, I can't <clears throat> prescribe you a dose of vitamin D for your requirements. So th this is not me prescribing to you. It's not possible to prescribe on the internet, but I am reporting what I take. Now, let's compare. So we believe that Dr. Fauci is taking 6,000 international units a day, which is the 150 micrograms. Uh, if I'm wrong about Dr. Fauci, I'm sorry, uh, but it looks like a genuine email to me. Um, and, it, and it all makes sense, as we'll see in a minute. Now, um, the guidelines from the National Institute of Health here. Uh, let me get me out of the way. Uh, so this is saying that, say, for the, uh, the average adult, um, they should be taking six to eight hundred micrograms uh, a day. And yet Dr. Fauci is taking... Uh, way more than that. He's taking 6,000 international units per day, we believe. So he's taking a much higher dose. Now, this is interesting because remember the background here. And we've done this so many times you'll be bored with it, but I'm just going to quickly flash it again. 42% uh, of the US population is deficient, according to Healthline. Higher in uh, black and African Americans, higher in Hispanics. So we have this interesting um, tension here where uh, Dr. Fauci is personally taking a higher dose, but the guidelines are a much lower dose. Now, is this just the United States? No, England as well. And again, to get this right, I've done a screenshot here. Um, to protect bone and muscle health, this is just from the uh, Public Health England website this morning, uh, the average daily intake of 10 micrograms per day. So there we have it. So the um, the UK is recommending uh, 10 micrograms per day. Uh, the American authorities were recommending slightly more, about, about there, weren't they? Slightly more. They were recommending uh, 600, 600 per day. 600 IUs per day. So we see that what I'm taking and what we believe Dr. Fauci taking is significantly higher than these official guidelines. And these official guidelines don't seem to take into account the individual. So, for example, if someone is exposed to very little sun, they're probably going to need, well, they are going to need a higher dose. Uh, if someone is obese and has been deficient in vitamin D, it's going to take them much longer to top up than someone who is not uh, obese because the vitamin D will absorb into the adipose tissue. Um, recommendations for younger children, slightly different check on your, on your own country's recommendations. But here we see this, this tension between what the science seems to be saying we should be taking 
and the official guidelines that seem to be recommending these very, what, what appears to me to be very small doses. So what I think is the best thing to do is be worried about this is get a vitamin D test. Go to your own doctor and, and get a vitamin D test to see what your blood levels are. Because as we know, if you're a white American, you're about 42% chance of being deficient. If you're a black American, 82% chance of being deficient. If you're Hispanic American, 70% chance of being deficient, roughly. So th this, is a, this is a big issue. And we know vitamin D is associated with immunity and a whole range of other things. So I just thought that was uh, fascinating. Now, if that email's uh, genuine, that's a, a real insight. And it, it looks genuine. So, but anyway, just to recapitulate, I can't prescribe. You have to decide on your own dose with your own doctor. But uh, they're the sort of thinking that I would uh, that I've taken into account. Now, moving on to something else that's completely uh, I thought I thought was quite fascinating, really. Um, Facial mask wearing for COVID-19, potential for variolation, variolation as we await a vaccine. So um, Edward, uh, Edward Jenner was, was 17, 1796, I think Edward Jenner first vaccinated using cowpox against smallpox. And uh, vaccines have been developed. Louis Pasteur did quite a lot in the 1890s and then they've been developed through the 20th century. But anyway, what this variolation was, variol so variola is the old name for um, smallpox. It means, I think it means, it's Latin for spotty or something like that, is it? Yes, I've checked that. Sp spotted, it's Latin for spotted. Um, and smallpox was the title that was uh, developed in the, probably in the 1700s to differentiate uh, smallpox, which was the variola infection from the great pox which of course was syphilis um but uh anyway so variolation so so what variolation did was it took some um pus from people that were infected with smallpox and gave non-infected people a small dose in other words variolation meant infecting people with a small amount of smallpox hoping that that would generate immunity to a, a large amount of smallpox should they be later exposed and, and the name variolation just stuck a better term would be inoculation it's to give a live dose of an organism to generate immunity and this happens all the time so when you're exposed to a particular organism you're going to generate active immunity to it active specific immunity to it so this idea of variolation the way that it's using the word here in this new england journal of medicine article means to give a low dose of the actual disease to generate immunity to the disease. And of course, this is intriguing because there's accumulating evidence that low doses of COVID-19 can generate immunity, but is much more likely to generate an asymptomatic or a minimally symptomatic infection than larger doses. And this is actually being talked about now in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I thought that was well worth a look so in other words, inoculation, allowing people to have a low dose of coronavirus, COVID-19, in order to generate immunity. I'm not recommending this. This is what I'm discussing what this paper says. We want potentially uh, thin ice here, but uh, this is what this paper says. Uh, universal mask wearing might make mild or asymptomatic disease more likely. And that's a form of variolation. This concept of giving a low dose of the active organism to generate immunity, but hopefully not giving a severe disease. That's what this means by variolation, which is really a form of inoculation. Generates immunity, that would slow the spread of the virus. Viral shedding from the noses, mouths of patients, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. We know this happens. That's why we need universal mask wearing. Shedding rates equivalent to those amongst symptomatic patients. We know this is happening. So everyone needs to be treated as if they are potentially infectious because we don't know who's spreading the virus because of the asymptomatics and the pre-symptomatics. But wearing a mask can mean you get a lower dose, which essentially means you have a, a variolation effect. So I thought this is very interesting thinking to be formally written up in the New England Journal of Medicine is, is, very, uh, is quite intriguing really.
There I am. Now, in SARS uh, coronavirus, it's not called coronavirus, it's not called severe acute respiratory syndrome one. This is the 2002 2003 outbreak. It's actually still called the SARS. I just call it the one to separate it from the SARS coronavirus 2, which we now have. And studies from that showed a strong relationship between public masking and pandemic control. So this has been known about for some time. And of course, this begs the question, why on earth were the infectious diseases doctors who study this sort of thing not flagging this up at a much earlier stage? Um, strange. Um, but they weren't, or most of them weren't. Um, now, SARS coronavirus 2, um, recent virologic, epidemiological and ecological data has got the hypothesis that face masking may also reduce the severity of the disease among people who do become infected. So data from uh, studying the viruses, data from studying the distribution of disease, data from studying the relationship of the virus and people in their own communities indicate that this now appears to, well, the evidence for this is certainly accumulating. This is consistent with long-standing theories of viral pathogenesis. And we did look at this when we looked at uh, influenza and patients that were given lower doses of influenza got less severe disease, but still generated immunity. New England Journal of Medicine is catching up with us, which is... Uh, which is, is great. Um, severity of disease proportional to the viral inoculum received. So the inoculum is the amount of viruses that's received in this inoculation process. Another word for which is variolation process, which is the term we use because that's the term the New England Journal of Medicine is using. Typical rate of asymptomatic infections estimated to be 40% by the Centers for Disease Control in mid-July. Uh, settings with universal face masking, it seems to be 80% of people are asymptomatic. So that is the epidemiological data. Also less severe and less deaths. So here we have the mainstream medical literature openly discussing the possibility that it's not saying you shouldn't take all the precautions you should, but it's saying if you wear a mask, you're going to get a lower dose of inoculum. You've got a better chance of getting an asymptomatic infection of the disease. And that is consistent with this idea of variolation, which probably actually goes back to the Chinese, uh, Chinese medicine in the 14th and 15th century. It's got a long history of this in the history of disease. So there you go. The evidence is accumulating and is now being openly discussed in the medical literature. Uh, that this may generate more cases of asymptomatic disease. Of course, from this, we can't say go out and get infected. Of course, we're not saying that. We're saying take all precautions. But if you do wear a mask, it looks like the infection that you're going to get is more likely to be less serious. Couldn't get simpler, could it? That's, just, that's about as simple as this can get. It's, uh, and, and it's encouraging. We just need everyone to do it, of course. But what we need to do is get this message out. So the message was that wearing a mask is protecting other people from me <clears throat> if I'm a inf potentially infected person. What we need to do is get the message out that, no, this is protecting me because people do often act in their best uh, self-interest, unfortunately, don't they? Now, moving on to another study that I've been asked lots of questions about. disappearing where am i now i am lots of people have, have, have seen this as some now this has been i think this is Pitt, pittsburgh pittsburgh university or something seems to have been well publicized in the states tiny antibody component highly effective against covid19 is this going to be some sort of cure well let's look at what it is first of all so we know that uh, if someone is infected or vaccinated they're going to develop these antibodies and the antibodies are these Y-shaped molecules like this with a so-called multivariable region on the end. And it's this bit that recognises the, uh, this bit here that recognises the virus or the antigenic component of the virus, usually the spike protein in the case of uh, 
coronavirus 2. But if we look at this bit sort of magnified, what we actually see is that this is a very specific shape like this. It's a very specific chemical shape that binds exactly onto the receptor in this case in, on the spike protein. So that would be the spike protein there and that would be the antibody. And that's how the antibody binds onto the spike protein, hopefully neutralizing it. Now what this group in Pittsburgh have done, rather than taking making the whole antibody, they've just taken like a little bit of it like that. So they've just taken a little bit of it that's maybe uh, using this diagram as an example, just kind of, um, they've taken that bit. So that bit there is a blow up of what's inside that circle there. But the idea is that this bit would fit, still fit onto the spike protein. So if this is the spike protein here, it would still fit onto this bit of the spike protein. And that would get in the way. So it would be like a kind of stone in the shoe there, <laughs> if you like. Um, and, and that would stop the whole, that, that would stop the binding of the, of the virus. It would stop the binding of uh, this virus into the ACE2 receptor cells. So in other in other words, if we had the uh, if we imagine that's the virus there, like that, and we know that the virus has got these um, spike proteins, then rather than having a, an antibody which actually blocks off the whole end of the spike protein like that, like a whole antibody could do that. This is just like binding off like a, a little bit of it here, like this, that little bit of it there, like that. But that little bit could be enough to stop it binding into the ACE2 receptor site, therefore stop the RNA from the virus getting into the cell, body cell, to propagate the infection. So that's what this is, it's this tiny bit here. And it's, it's called um, AB8, evidence of in vitro and animals. So in other words, this has been demonstrated to work by the Pittsburgh team in animals and in, in the lab. Is it likely to work when it's scaled up? <clears throat> uh, very much I would have thought so, yes. Uh, the science behind this makes perfect sense. The trouble with this is, is what you call a monoclonal antibody. Now even this tiny bit, even this tiny, even this, keep clicking the wrong thing, sorry. Even this tiny bit here um, is still made of a protein. So remember uh, that bit there, that bit there is that bit there, and that's a tiny bit of that bit there. But this is still a remarkably complex protein. It's still a very complicated structure. And of course, we can't make proteins. We can't make proteins. For all our clever biochemists, we can't synthesize much in the way of protein. So what you have to do, actually what happens is, is that you, you recruit a line of cells, um, like, like the white blood cells that make the antibodies. You brew those up in culture and the cells make the antibodies for you. And because all the cells are the same clone, or the same type of cell that produces all of these same monovalent antibodies, they're, they're called monoclonal uh, antibodies. The trouble is, um, once you've got a setup, it's quite cheap to make them, but the trouble is in the past, they've always been sold for horrendous prices. So it depends how the prices pan out. But that's the answer to that question I've had many times. Um, so yeah, it looks like it's going to work. Yes, we'll need uh, phase, uh, phase two and phase three clinical trials. But it looks promising. If the price was anything like uh, right, it would be good. So, um, yep, the, the potential is there, uh, depending on the trials and depending on the economics of it. Thing is, with these monoclonal antibodies, they, they are expensive. There's a lot of R&D money up front. But once you're set up, it's actually pretty cheap to make them in large amounts. So. But then, of course, the, the, the firms that make them want to get their R&D money back. So you can kind of understand it. But um, at the same time, monoclonal antibodies are too expensive for perhaps the majority of the world's population at the moment, unfortunately. But who knows? Maybe the Pittsburgh team are going to change that. Let, let's hope so. But that's what it's about. Now, the UK um, are working on monoclonal antibodies as well. So monoclonal antibodies uh, to begin UK trial in the next few weeks. So uh, this is being added to the uh, recovery trial in the UK. 
So they're going to be part of the UK recovery trial. The initial number they want is 2,000. I think they're going to need another 2,000 for the control group as well. don't think that's enough. But anyway, um, neutralizing antibodies. So this is a therapy involving all of the, uh, the, all of the antibody. So they're going to be given these antibodies as far as we know. And again, these are going to be monoclonal antibodies produced by cultured white blood cells. Very often the white blood cells are, are combined with other cells. This is all quite complicated stuff. But basically you have a cell culture that will make these antibodies much in the same way that a vat of yeast will produce alcohol. It's a very similar uh, principle in many ways. It's a biosynthesis process. Um, so um, hoping to produce these. Uh, so th these are neutralizing antibodies. Uh, it's uh, this is what it's called the the R R E G N coronavirus two antibody. It's going to be a mixture of two monoclonal antibodies. It's produced by the U S uh, biotech term company, so it's produced by these guys. Now these guys have got a track record. As far as I know, they've made one for Ebola, and uh, I haven't checked the detail on it. But as far as I know, it's effective. So the potential for monoclonal antibodies to be completely curative is there. These could work. Uh, now, I'm very hopeful that this trial in the UK, which will start in a few years time, a few few weeks time, in the next week or two, I think. I'm very hopeful that this is going to yield positive results. But it is a phase three clinical trial. It will take quite a bit of time to do, and then of course it will depend on the price that the groups decide to make it available for. But these are antibodies that attach to the spike protein of the virus at slightly different places, therefore neutralize the virus. So the theory is very, very good. Right, don't want to go on too on today, but just, just a couple of things about vaccines. Uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, you might remember this one. This is one of the RNA vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines. And that's just that this chap, uh, CEO of Pfizer, seems to have been talking it up. Um, the Pfizer BioNTech, uh, US German collaboration. So uh, the, the, the chief operating executive officer is saying, uh, making good progress with the vaccine, which is good. It's kind of talking it up a bit. 60% chance we will know by the end of October if the vaccine is effective and safe. So what, six weeks, five, six weeks, this will be uh, definite. And if it's effective and safe, we believe that large doses, or many, many doses rather, have already been manufactured. So this is getting quite close now. And the fact that uh, a guy like this uh, goes public, to me, uh, is an expression of uh, optimism. And of course, it'll have effects on the share price. It's a pity this is all tied in with economics, but it, it, it does seem to be. Trials have been carried out on 30,000 people. Uh, that they're expanding that to 44,000. Good number for a phase three clinical trial, quite reasonable. Then move on to uh, FDA approval to certify. Already hundreds of thousands of doses ready to go. Yeah, I thought they had, they've already made it, so it's ready to go. As soon as this bit is confirmed by the phase three clinical trials, they are ready to go mass manufacturer in hand and we believe they can make an awful lot of them so this looks like and all the intimations from the earlier stages of the clinical trial look like this is going to be successful so it looks like people are going to start getting vaccinated in november december of course the the, the rolling out is going to take time now this this uh, th this just grabbed me as well this is really interesting because the United Arab Emirates appear to be way ahead of the United States. Um, or are they just skipping stages? Interesting question. You decide. I'll tell you a bit about it. This is the last thing for today. Um, so the phase two, one and phase two, phase one and phase two trials reported in June and they were positive. Now, this is the United Arab Emirates are using the Chinese developed vaccine tested on 31,000 volunteers so far. Now this is the Chinese vaccine. And I must say, 
maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, but I like the approach the Chinese are taking here. So that Pfizer BioNTech is, is an R messenger RNA that'll get into the cells that will stimulate the cells to make the, uh, the, the antigen. So the body cells will produce the antigen, which will stimulate the body to produce the antibodies. It's a completely new approach to vaccine, never been done before. Well, not, not, not for infectious viruses anyway. Certainly never been used in anger before. So it's all kind of new, although, although it's very promising. Results are good. But what the Chinese have done, they've done it the most old fashioned way. They've taken SARS coronavirus 2 viruses, they've killed them. Well, that's not the right word, it attenuated them. They've weakened them with a chemical to mean that the virus should no longer be infected. So the person's actually injected with attenuated, weakened versions of the virus. So the individual who's being vaccinated, their immune system can make antibodies to the actual real virus, the actual SARS coronavirus 2 virus. But that virus has been weakened so it can no longer reproduce inside the cells. And this is the old fashioned tried and trusted way to vaccinate. You attenuate the organism, you weaken the organism or kill the organism. Sometimes it's killed, sometimes it's attenuated. It's not clear to me what the Chinese are doing yet. It looks like it's heavily attenuated. But what this means is you actually end up with the actual virus in your body and you make antibodies to the actual virus. It's just that the virus can't reproduce. So when the proper virus comes along, you've got the antibodies. Old fashioned, tried, trusted technology. I must say, I like it because it's simple. It's simple. Now, the United Arab Emirates seem to be rolling this out, as far as I can tell, now. Now, what's this based on? 100% of volunteers generated antibodies after two doses in 28 days. Wow, I mean, if, if now this is, to be fair, this is not peer reviewed. This is not in a scientific paper. This is more in a science uh, magazine. But this does reflect, as we understand it, what is happening on the ground in the United Arab Emirates. So um, we need to see the peer reviewed data, but this is actually happening. This is kind of more like a news story, really. 100% um, of volunteers generated antibodies after two doses. Now, there were initial reports that it would need three doses. So that needs clarified. But they're saying 100% generated antibodies after two doses. Six weeks, 31,000 volunteers, 125 nationalities. That's good. Lots of nationalities involved. Uh, phase, three trial to start, phase three started on the 16th of July. This is from the Chinese National Pharmaceutical Group. These guys, these are the ones that make it. Nice old fashioned virus vaccine making technique. Collaborating with the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi. Um, clinical trials are simultaneously going on in Bahrain, Jordan and Egypt. So we're, you know, we're in pretty large numbers here already. And they're claiming, this article claims 100,000 inje injections given so far. And what the, this article says, I mean, check it out for yourself. I've given you the reference. As always, um, that's your reference there. What this is saying is no severe adverse reactions so far and no one has caught the infection. So they seem to be claiming complete efficacy and complete safety. Now, um, let's see. It's too early to see. I expect there will be the odd adverse reaction, but... Um, this is what's currently being said, sounds good, and it's a nice old fashioned tried and trusted way of making a vaccine. Uh, mild and expected side effects, obviously you're always going to get that. But they did say, I mean, when we say mild side effects with vaccine, you'll have had this yourself, you know, you, you get a vaccine against something and um, you just don't feel right for two or three days, your arm probably starts hurting, all these things are expected. This is just the body generating the immune response. Release of cytokines can make you feel a bit sick for a few days, but small doses of cytokines, hopefully. So um, what this is saying is no severe side effects, complications. Uh, now, also, we noticed 150 nationalities were involved, but al also um, a thousand of the volunteers had chronic disease. So this is not just young, healthy individuals that has been taken. This is a real world uh, cross section of individuals. Uh, volunteers are now receiving their second shot. Uh, but, as we already read, um, 
it gives uh, approval for emergency use is already granted. So that means it looks, looks like it's already, already going. And they do say, I don't know, I'm not sure about this, but what they say is they've been able to do things quickly because they have artificial intelligence and some, some supercomputers working out the, um, working out the uh, results of the studies. Um, but quite how that gives rise to new information, I don't know. Um, because all you've got to do is crunch the stats and see if it works, but that's what they're saying. So artificial intelligence and supercomputing is helping this process. If it is, I'm all for it, but it's not something I would pretend to to, to uh, fully understand. But interesting, interesting. India uh, is talking about fast-tracking a vaccine. Uh, just uh, popular news outlets. Doesn't seem to say uh, which one. I know the Oxford vaccine is being manufactured uh, now in India, so it could well be that one. So there we go. Um, a lot of interesting sciencey things. Um, you know, as Francis Collins says, you know, our, our thinking needs to be driven by the science, by the science, and nothing but the science. Um, we, we don't want any uh, political interference in the in the scientific uh, process. So that's what I've tried to do in this, just relate to the science that's going on. Um, but wasn't that interesting that Dr. Fauci seems to be taking a much higher dose of vitamin C than the official guidelines? And again, I would call on a review uh, by the vested people, like Public Health England or whoever it is, to review this guidelines, uh, to review the guidelines on vitamin D dose. And let me give you one simple reason for that. Winter is coming. We're going to be out less. We're going to be in. There's no going to be any sun to go out on where I live uh, in a week or two's time. And um, vitamin D levels all over will be dropping because we know they drop every winter. And this is a winter where we need as much immunological protection as we can possibly get as individuals and as whole populations okay well that's today um interesting stuff going on um plenty to think about okay thank you for tuning in as always always great to have you if you've stayed to the end i appreciate it particularly thank you for staying